Hey folks, this is a video about a pretty complicated hydraulic repair on my excavator, and I find this stuff really fascinating, so I've included a lot of explanation and details, but I know not everybody wants all that. So I've put chapters in. If you get to a portion of the video and you feel like I'm talking too much, you want to skip ahead, just go down, click to the next chapter, and you'll bypass it all real quick. If you do want to learn about this stuff, I definitely recommend you watch the whole video. It's really cool stuff. Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. So today we are going to tackle this, this blade cylinder. This blade right here will not stay in the down position for very long at all. You push it down and that stabilizes you when you're digging and it's nice for about a minute and then it suddenly you're bouncing around and it's because this is lifted up you got to push it down again. The most likely cause of this is what we call bypassing. There's a piston inside the barrel here and there's seals where it slides against the barrel on the inside. <laughs> And if those seals wear and oil can get past, it will pump oil into the cylinder to put it in position, but then it leaks past the seals and it ends up moving. So that's the most likely problem, but it isn't necessarily the problem. It could also be the controls. I wanna do some testing and determine which is it before I pull the cylinder off and rebuild it. First though, I wanna jack this thing up. You know, this thing weighs 14,000 pounds. It's not the easiest thing in the world to jack up. Or is it? It's just fun when a machine can jack up itself. Yeah, I noticed a couple of details that you wouldn't see on a cheaper machine. They put this guard here to protect the rod, which is great because you're down right here at ground level where stuff can end up hitting it. And they also did not put on a regular cylinder. Typically a cylinder would have the retraction port here and the extension port here. The oil in this is running through the rod so that the hoses are all up here. And if a rock comes and hits this, it's unlikely to damage anything. Whereas if you had a hydraulic hose coming down here, even a hard line, a rock hitting it can crack it and then you're spewing hydraulic fluid all over the place. And this is, I can tell it's a real heavy barrel. Started moving. That thing doesn't want to take grease very well. Yeah, that pin wasn't greasing. All right, this test to check for bypassing or not is very cool, in my opinion. I checked the service manual because you can't look at this and tell which one's retraction, which one's extension. This is the extension, this is the retraction, according to the service manual. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna disconnect the extension side and I'm gonna cap it. Then we're gonna test it. If it's bypassing, when I hit the retract, the cylinder will extend. And uh, if you care to, think about that and figure out why. It's pretty cool. We'll look at it in a minute, but first let's go ahead and do this test. Let's see what it does. That is not what I was expecting. It didn't move. Assuming that my service manual was right and that is the retraction side, then that means the cylinder is not bypassing. I'm gonna flip these around because if you do it the other way, it also should not move. But then I know for sure this cylinder is not bypassing. Well, unfortunately, this side is not cooperating. The threads on this are all jacked up. It's very difficult to get off, and this cap will not go on there. There's no sense fighting with it. I'm gonna need to take this fitting off and go get a new one. All the fittings on this machine are Imperial. They're British pipe. Why? I have no idea. 
Here I'm testing again on the other side. This slight amount of movement is normal. There's no evidence of bypassing here. Have you figured it out yet? Why a bypassing cylinder will extend when you hit retract? Now brace yourself for some mad art skills. I can't draw. Okay, so there's your hydraulic cylinder. We've got the extension side and the retraction side. If you want to retract a cylinder, you inject oil into this side. You allow this side to go to tank, so you give the oil a place to come out. And when you do that, the cylinder will retract. Vice versa, if you want it to extend, you inject high pressure oil in here. You give this oil a path to tank, and that will make the cylinder extend. And these, these things flip-flopping is what the control valves are doing. So how can we determine if these seals are leaking? I capped off right here. The only thing that was connected was the retraction chamber. If the seals are not leaking, what's going to happen here? You inject your oil. It builds up pressure here. The oil is not very compressible, so this is going to move a tiny bit. This will equalize in the same pressure and nothing will happen. We're taking advantage of, I'll call it a feature of hydraulic cylinders that's not at first intuitive. And I have another video on hydraulic cylinders. I'll link to that here if you want to see a little more on this. But the fact of the matter is this chamber here has more oil and more surface area on the piston than this chamber does because of the rod. The rod takes up some of the oil area and it also gets in the way. So you can only push on the piston here and here. Now it's 3D, but you get the point. In the center there, this chamber is not able to push on that piston. In this chamber, there's nothing in the way, so it can push everywhere. And of course the oil is at a PSI, a pounds per square inch, so it's all about the surface area that it's pushing against. This pushing here that way is offset by this pushing here that way. And same with here. But this right here, there's no counter to it. So if these seals are leaking, at first you're going to build up pressure on this side. These seals leak so that oil is going to find its way to the other side. There's more surface area. So even though the oil is at the same PSI, this piston is going to move in that direction because of this additional force. And the piston's going to extend. Now let me show you something else. This is really interesting. Let's go to a new cylinder here. New cylinder, no seals. Both of these are capped, and of course it's full of oil. If you then tried to push, say you pushed with it like a tractor, you're really putting some force on this thing, what's going to happen? Obviously it's not going to extend. Your answers are it's either going to retract or it's not going to do anything. What do you think? The answer is it's not going to do anything. If you look at it for a while, you might figure out why. You have a closed system here. You have a certain volume of oil in here, and that oil has nowhere to go. You also have a certain volume of metal in here, in the piston and in the rod. That volume takes up some of this space. If you push that rod in to here, now you have this much additional volume in this chamber, and there's no room for it, so it won't move. That was the plug that was holding it all back. So we tested the cylinder, it's not bypassing, so we know it's not the cylinder. In a way that's a disappointment to me because I can just pull the cylinder off, repack it, put it back on and I'd be done. Now I have to go through this somewhat complex, but not as bad as it looks, hydraulic system and find where the other problems might be. So let me break this down for you. You've got a hydraulic pump. This pump is supplying high pressure to the control valves. This is a series of valves. There's 12 of these lined up and they control all the functions of the machine. There's one for the travel motor, there's one for the boom cylinder, there's one for the dipper cylinder. Everything has its own control valve. In my case, A8, this one right here controls the blade. There's a little handle in the cab and when I push or pull the handle, I am pushing or pulling on the spool, the switch, in this control valve. What that does is it sends hydraulic pressure through the line and then it goes through this swivel joint. We'll talk about this in a second. And then it goes to the cylinder. After it goes through the cylinder, the opposite side of the cylinder is given the other circuit back to the control valve, which allows the fluid to go to tank. Here's the spool. It's called a spool because, you know, it's basically a big cylinder with wide areas and narrow areas. And those narrow areas are making passages for oil to flow. 
that if you move the spool a little bit, the wide area will cover up the narrow area and block the flow. So it's a way that you can simultaneously control multiple passages of oil flow. When you move this spool one way, it allows a path of oil out and in. When you move the spool the other way, it's the opposite, in and out. So that's what your control valves do. This swivel joint, this thing's kind of cool and very necessary. A lot of machines have an undercarriage. It's called the undercarriage because it's almost like a separate unit. The tracks are sitting down here and then the upper portion is free to rotate around it endlessly. So the two are, are separate from each other. Now the motor and the hydraulic pump are on the upper portion. So you can hard connect everything. You can have a hydraulic hose running from the upper portion all the way to the boom cylinder with no issues. There's never going to be any movement between those two. Now the blade is on the undercarriage. So I, I need to hydraulically connect from the pump to the undercarriage. How do I do that? because the, the engine and the pump can endlessly rotate around this. So you can't run a hose from your hydraulic pump to the blade cylinder because it's gonna get twisted up. Same with the travel motors, hydraulic motors in each track. So how do you do that? Well, that's what this swivel joint does. Sorry about the rain noise, but I've got everything exposed so that we can see it all. The hydraulic tank is right there. Obviously, here's the engine. Well, here's the hydraulic pump. That's the main thing that this engine is doing. There's actually a few different pumps in there, and they're sending oil out in high pressure to the main control valve block. Come over here. And down there, all those hoses plugging into it is the main control valve block. You can see them better here you can see it's starting to look like what what we were looking at in the picture so this actually does the thumb and you can see how it's pulling on that lever there and that is manipulating the spool and that control valve here I'm moving one of the travel levers and you can see it's pulling on that spool and now it's pushing on that spool so that's how those work. So then if we're gonna go under the machine next and look at the swivel joint. And here is the swivel joint. But you can see how all these hydraulic lines here are fixed to this cylinder. And then the upper hydraulic lines are fixed to this cylinder. And that is where the magic happens. That's where this can rotate inside of this endlessly and no hydraulic lines get twisted up what my problems could be. One very simple thing it could be is maybe my cable is not allowing this spool to go back to the neutral position. So that's the first thing I'm gonna check. It could be leaking in the control valve. It could be leaking in this swivel joint. There's one other thing. All these have pressure relief valves. If the pressure gets above a certain threshold, this device here opens a path back to tank to relieve the pressure. That pressure relief valve could be malfunctioning. It's not supposed to open until it gets to above operating pressure, but if maybe a piece of trash has gotten stuck in it or it's worn out. So here's the blade lever control right there. That's blade down, that's blade up. So if we look down at that cable there. There's the cable. There, I'm moving the, the lever. So I'm going to disconnect this cable and we're going to see if that makes any difference. Yeah, that's definitely in its neutral position now. So let's see if that made any difference. We're definitely still sagging, so that didn't make any difference. Okay, I wanna check the swivel joint. The way I need to do that is isolate this, see if the, the cylinder still won't hold pressure. And the way to do that is to disconnect the control valve on the side of the circuit that you're trying to check. So I can disconnect B8, I can cap both ends of that. So now I've taken the control valve and the pressure relief valve out of the equation. If it still leaks, then the swivel joint's the problem. If it doesn't, then it's either the control valve or this pressure relief valve. So now I need to disconnect this and cap it. That's easy. It's, it's that one. This is the right sized wrench, but it won't. I don't have any way to spin it. 
I need this wrench to have more of, a, of an angle. I need it to be more like that. They make wrenches like that. I don't have any, obviously. So it looks like we're going to be doing some wrench modifications. Might be enough. I don't know. All right, let's see if our new wrench can get on that thing. Yes, it can. Ah. Now maybe a straight wrench will do. Man, they give you some tight quarters to work in. Yeah, I'm able to do it by hand. That's cool. Caps are easier because there's no hydraulic line in the way and you can actually use the box end of the wrench. Yeah, there we go. All right, hose going to the down pressure of this cylinder is capped. So the machine is not able to pressurize this. The only way I can pressurize it is to let the jacks off and have the weight of the machine push to pressurize that side. If it still sags, that means it's the swivel. So I really hope it doesn't sag right now because that thing is going to be a bear to, to get out of there and rebuild. Oh man! So I wanted to point out, this is a pressure relief valve. There's another one. So if I had isolated the swivel joint and it had held pressure at that point, then my my issue is it's either this valve or the pressure relief valve. It's actually this one, but you get the point. So what I would have done is I would have taken that pressure relief valve and I would have swapped it out for a different one to see if it makes any difference. If that didn't make any difference, then it's the valve. If it did make the difference, then obviously it's the pressure relief valve. But my problem is the swivel joint. And you know, of all the problems it could have been, this is the most difficult and most time consuming to fix. Am I surprised? Nope. I think there's like 20 hoses that I'm going to have to deal with. See, I just on the bottom here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, let's get started here. So first thing I'm going to do is label the hose as I take it off. And label with zip ties something that's not going to be erasable. One black and one black shows me where that hose goes. Ah. And you're reaching up through the hole, so it wants to run into your armpit. That's just awful. <laughs> Ow. I knew that was going to hurt. It's loose at the fitting, but not at the hose where I need it. It's safe to say I'd rather be working on my Johnson. This wouldn't be bad. I don't mind the challenge of getting the wrench on there and getting the things off, but with the oil dripping all over you, that's just miserable. Oh, 
right in the face and right in the camera. I guess we both experienced that. It did the same thing. It loosened at the stupid joint there and not at the, uh, the one that I'm trying to undo. That's obnoxious. Vice grip should not let that spin now. Oh, look at that. Let's see if my uh, little wristband is gonna help me with the oil pouring down my arm. Get it first. Oh, come on. Yeah, the wristband's actually working. That's funny. All right, so there's that side. Now, we get to do that again. Whew. That one really gushed. And if it wasn't for the oil dripping all down me, this wouldn't be bad. But let's just say I'm not gonna be sorry when this is done. So this is the last one on the bottom. Once I get this off, I'm hoping I can unbolt the swivel joint and either push it out the top or pull it out the top to get to those top hoses easier. Man, I really hope I can do it from the top because that's going to be a bear to do from down here. Maybe this one will be nice enough not to spill oil all over me. Oh, no such luck. I'll tell you what, I am a fan of the Pigmat wristband. <laughs> I think I'm going to start a new fad. I can reach them with some crow's foot wrenches, at least a few of them. Working all the way up that high, I'm going to need a Pigmat bodysuit. So here we are up in the cab. There's our swivel joint right there. And you can see it's loose, but there's a lot of lines crossing over it. Looks like a big return line here. Not sure what the best strategy is here. Sometimes just what you need is a giant oil pan. There, that'll catch everything that comes down from above. I'm getting these from the top. One way or another. So, this rat's nest of hoses. The majority of these all go to the swivel joint. This one does not, this one does not, and this one does not. I disconnected those lines, so now I'm pretty, pretty well open up here. Now, I have a question. I just want to make sure that this is put together right and that the previous owner didn't rig something together that's about to fail. Look, I got hose clamps here. Hose clamps. Hose clamps. The other end of this line goes to a proper hydraulic fitting. And like hose clamps here, but the other side of this valve here, I've got proper hydraulic. Is this a rigged hose or is this how it's supposed to be? I mean, it's not leaking. They're bigger lines than most of the lines, so they got to be low pressure. Maybe they're just returned to the tank and pipe clamps are fine. I don't know. <sighs> Thing's quite heavy. Man doesn't want to come through that hole. I need to berth a swivel joint. Okay, back underneath. I got this board wedged underneath it. All right, I can actually get to a lot of these now. Somewhat reasonably. Well, I had a battery failure there, but got one off, got it capped, and it's much nicer to be above it than it is to be beneath it. You might even say I like being on top. The top fittings are better than the bottom ones, but now the challenge is, that since the joint is free to move, I have to counter the torque that I apply with the wrench or the whole thing will just pivot. See, I can get this wrench on the square part of that fitting, and then at the same time, I can get it up over top where this floor pan bolt went through. Now it can't rotate. Sometimes they really start yipping and make quite a chorus. If they do, I'll stop and try to get it on camera. 
I am loving my new shop edition. It's dark and I barely even notice it. <laughs> you hear that coyote? hear them over there and I hear them over there and for those of you wondering coyotes can be a problem for like a newborn calf but cows don't really have much trouble with them around here at least a pack of coyotes can run down a cow they basically just exhaust it and then take it down it would have to be a big pack but there's just so much easier prey around here that they don't generally do that I have heard of it happening but uh, I've never had any trouble with it knock on wood and all the lines are disconnected. Yeah, that's all you had to do. Just take the swivel joint out. No big deal. If those were wolves, I might have something to worry about, but coyotes are never going to do anything. Not to a person. They're after rabbits and raccoons and possums and whatnot. So there you go. There's our swivel joint. See, it rotates there. Can you imagine how this works now? It's a very, really simple solution to a seemingly complex problem. How do you get hydraulic fluid to flow across a pivot? So all the hydraulic lines are fixed to this piece. All the hydraulic lines are fixed to this piece. So all the hydraulic fluid is going through this unit. See all these holes here? These are just plugs. Those don't need to come out. Kind of a hint in how it was built. Yeah, next thing we need to do, <clears throat> we're going to take the bottom off. That just seals with an O-ring. So now if you look down inside, you can see that there's a bunch of different channels at different levels with seals in between. The black area there is a seal. I see a seal that's in rough shape. And that was my problem. That was allowing pressure from the extend side of the blade cylinder to leak somewhere else. So we gotta replace all those seals. This is just a cheap Harbor Freight pick. And basically I'm gonna stab the seal <gasps> and just try to get behind it. And you just pull it out. So that's what we're dealing with. And it looks like I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these.
Let's see how torn up that is. All the hours that I've put in so far for this are to replace this little piece of plastic. This is the bad seal. This is the Jeffrey Dahmer of seals. So now you can see how all this was built. This piece is cast, drill and tap these holes, but of course they casted the bosses in, and then reach inside and cut all your grooves. This piece, it was just a solid cylinder. It actually looks like they welded two pieces together, but you could machine this out of one piece if you wanted to. These plugs up here, you drilled down through that to this level, and then you drilled in from the side. Now you have a communication from there, and it also communicates with this tapped hole here. So basically you've got a U shape. It goes in here, up, out here. This one, you only had to drill down this far. So it goes in here, up, out here, and this one. So each one of these communicates with a different level and that corresponds to a, a different oil chamber. Once you're done, put these plugs in. Now, interesting to me, it looks like they use Teflon tape on this. And I'm sure this is factory. You know, I've always been told don't use Teflon tape on hydraulics because bits of it will get off into the system and cause problems. Maybe Teflon tape isn't a big deal. I don't know. Comment if you do. I also took all the fittings off so that I could replace the O-rings behind those. Make sure to keep track of where they go. All right, here's all the seals I need. I've got nine of these, eight of these, seven of these, and a couple O-rings. What do I predict these are going to cost? Those shouldn't be more than like $2 a piece. These for pennies. So that's two bucks, two, four, six, eight. And then these will be like $5 a piece. Five times seven, 35. So under 50 bucks. <laughs> all right. Here's all my old seals. Here's my new seals. <laughs> and how much did they cost? Well, <laughs> Try $330 with freight. The O-rings were cheap, but those internal seals are like $40 a pop. And I got these straight from a Yanmar dealer. I probably could bargain shop and get them cheaper somewhere, but I just don't want to have the wrong things in there. It's too much work to work on this thing to put in crappy parts and have to do it again. Ugh. The old seals were one-part seals. There's seven of them. The new seals are two-part seals, and they're not even tight in each other kind of strange. I ended up on the phone for an hour trying to figure out, did I get the right part? Is it, you know, I don't want to throw the wrong thing in there. This is the right part, they assure me. These are a redesigned seal. So let's rebuild this sucker. An O-ring and a backup ring go on the top. They are different than the rest of the seals. Now I'm going to replace the O-rings on all these fittings. You know what? I don't want to put each one of these over those threads, but I can come up with something that'll make that easy. Got one of these little plastic pieces from my cap and plug set, which certainly is not gonna hurt that O-ring. And then I can put that over the threads and pop the O-ring off. Nice. Is these are nice and pliable, so they should go in very easily. Yeah, they push right in. Let's see how these go. These are kind of stiffer and quite thin. I was worried I was going to damage them if I was too rough with them. I don't want to crease it. Yeah, I don't see any way other than to evert them. They must be tough enough to take it. See, I've got it shoved down in there like that, and then straighten it out. Yeah, that's the way to do it. I'm just going to be gentle with them. Got some of my hydraulic oil here. I'm going to heat this up and soak these in warm oil before I put them in, making them a little more pliable. I reduce the chance of creasing them or damaging them. All right, well, this is gonna be very tough for me to film. A lot of this is gonna be fiddling down inside of this thing with my fat fingers.
right. That's one rebuilt swivel joint. Let's go put this sucker back in there. Got it all back together. Let me show you underneath. There she is, all oily again, because uh, you can't you can't hook up hydraulic lines without dumping oil all over you. But it's back in, and I must say I am glad to have that done with. I need a break from hydraulic oil. All right, now we're at the good part. Uh, I'm going to leave most of the covers off. We're going to start it up. I'm going to make sure it doesn't have any major leaks, like maybe a line I forgot to tighten up or something. And then we're going to see if I actually fix the blade. Man, that would be disappointing if I didn't, but I'm pretty confident I did. Everything looks good. It's amazing. I can even feel a difference in strength of the machine. Before, I wasn't able to lift the whole machine with the blade and the boom. All right, it's been sitting here for five minutes. I don't see any evidence of leaks, and this sucker is fixed. Can't believe it's stronger than I knew. Man, that's gratifying. That was a lot of work. This is a pile of topsoil that's been sitting here for longer than I care to mention. I've always wanted to move it to the garden, and now that the dump truck's working and the excavator's working, we're going to get it done. No, it's not on fire. It's just smoking from an early morning cold start.
my boom lift is basically the same setup. It has the upper section that can spin endlessly over the undercarriage. And the undercarriage has several things that are hydraulically actuated. The drive motors, there's one on each wheel, and then also the steering. The steering cylinder there, there's also hydraulic cylinders under there to extend the axles and retract the axles. So all that has to cross the pivot. So there's gotta be a swivel joint on this thing. And there it is. And it allows that fluid to go through channels just like on the excavator. Interestingly, there's also some electrical circuits that need to cross and that's hidden under this plate, but it's basically the same thing. There's a cylinder, there's brushes that are spring loaded against it so that it can spin and the electrical signal passes through. Here we've got the engine, then we've got the hydraulic pump. And that's the main thing that this engine does is drive that pump. On the other side of the machine, you know, it looks a little different, but we've got various control valves. This is the one for the main lift. That's the lift cylinder. These are the hoses that I disconnected when I was getting that cylinder out. Pressure relief valves. And then up here, we have some electrically actuated control valves. So under the dump truck, that is a gearbox coming off the transmission that they call the PTO or the power takeoff. It drives a hydraulic pump. And this is the control valve. And does that look familiar? That's the spool. So when I pull the dump function in the truck, it pulls the spool out. That sends high pressure fluid to the cylinder, which dumps the bed. Now a tractor is a little different, more complicated in some ways because it's modular. It's made to have different attachments. The engine does many things other than just running the hydraulic pump. But obviously here's the engine. This is the hydraulic pump. It sends high pressure fluid to various portions on the tractor. And here's the loader control. And these are the control valves for that. You move the spools directly when you're moving this control knob. And here I'm going to put that loader down, pushing it forward. Also on a tractor, you have the remote control valves. These are on the back. Here's your pressure relief valve. And these control valves are controlled right here with these handles to control whatever attachment you, you have back here. In this case, the backhoe. And the main lines come in here, and then there's a bunch of control valves under here that you directly manipulate with the levers. Tractors are so versatile because the engine obviously drives the wheels. There's a transmission. And then it also has this power takeoff. So that's a spline shaft that you can hook into and rotate things with the engine. A lot of attachments run off of that, like rotary cutters and whatnot. Even this old log splitter is the same setup. Engine, hydraulic pump, control valves, and you're just manipulating a spool. I hope you guys found this video helpful. Hydraulic systems used to be a mystery to me. And hopefully I've taken some of the mystery out of that for you. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Check the description if you want to look for ways to support the channel. I'm really doing my best to grow the channel and everybody's support is really helpful. I do have more repairs to do on this excavator. Those will come in the future, uh, but I've got a bunch of other things on the list. Plenty more content on the way. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one.